Good morning, West Side. We have a kind of impromptu church service this morning, but that's kind of a little bit exciting in its own right. Uh, all right, well, let's get into our text for today. We know we are working our way through John, and we are going to be in John chapter 3. So we are cruising right through. Uh, we've already seen uh, the miracle in Canaan, the wedding, the changing water to wine. After that, we saw Jesus go through the temple and basically tell everybody who's boss. Today, we're looking at Nicodemus. And, um, you know, Romans chapter 11 says, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. And so... Um, most of you have obviously noticed that my chosen preaching style is expository preaching. And in case you don't know too much about the different styles of preaching, there's expository, which you pick a book of the Bible and you basically read through a chapter at a time and you preach whatever the chapter is about. That's my chosen method. And I think that that's important because when you do expository preaching, God is the one choosing the message. Anybody, when you preach uh, topical preaching, then you're the one deciding what the message. And personally, I think that there is more value in expository preaching because you're picking a book and you're going through all that God wanted to communicate to his people. If you choose topical sermons, which occasionally a topical sermon is just fine, but the danger with a topical sermon every Sunday is when God says, Behold the goodness and the severity, sometimes topical preachers will only preach about the goodness. Or, on the other hand, you may have a preacher that only preaches about the severity. And we don't want either of those all by itself, right? And so to me, the expository preaching, when we go straight through a book, straight through all that God left us, we're getting the goodness and the severity as God laid it out chapter by chapter by chapter. And so it's important to me to be that guy that preaches through a book. When we come to some goodness, I hope that I can preach the best sermon possible on God's goodness. And when we come to God's severity, I hope I can preach the best gospel sermon possible on God's severity. Today, as we read through Nicodemus, this is not an easy sermon for me because I don't like, it's not easy, it's not my nature to talk about God's severity. And yet, the gospel of John um, makes it very clear, it makes it very black and white that there is only two possibilities in store for mankind. One is to believe in Jesus Christ and to be obedient to him and to have salvation. And the other possibility is to ignore all of that and to have God's wrath fall upon you. So Nicodemus' story is unique. And um, I titled the sermon, Everybody Talking About, he Everybody Talking About Heaven Ain't Going There. And even that's not easy for me to say. So I'm just letting you, we're, we're getting to know each other. I don't like being the Betty Downer. Is that what they call it? It's not easy for me to say that everybody going to heaven ain't going there because I wish it was the opposite. I wish we could hand out cotton candy and lattes and say, there, you're all saved. But as a minister, as a preacher of God's word, I've got to give his word the, word, the way he gave it. Isn't that right? It's a hard job to be up here. It is a hard job to be a minister. So hard that do you know not even Jesus could do it? That strikes people as strange. Not even Jesus could do it? Well, the job of a minister is to tell people that they need to be, repent and be converted and live a life dedicated to God. And Jesus would have been the best person at doing that, and even he couldn't convince everybody. Am I right? Even Jesus couldn't convince everybody. And so it must be the hardest job in the world. But we will make our best effort. When we start talking about heaven and hell and those that are saved and those that are not saved, it kind of reminds me of, uh, do we remember the movie Lion King? 
And when all the coyotes or jackals were all together, huh? The hyenas. And one of them said, Mufasa. And the other ones all shivered. Ooh, say it again, say it again. Mufasa. Ooh, just shiver when somebody says that. Because why? Because Mufasa is the boss. Mufasa is the boss. And nobody, nobody gets to tell the boss what to do. It's scary when the boss talks. And I feel like today is one of those shivering moments. It's a little bit scary, but the boss is going to talk to us today. So we are going to read, if you have your Bibles, let's pick up in John chapter 3. We're going to read about Nicodemus. And actually, uh, an important preface to chapter 3 is verses 23, 24, and 25 of chapter 2. Uh, sometimes it's to our detriment that uh, somebody took it upon themselves to put chapters and verses because the chapter 3 designation makes it seem like we start out, there was a man of the Pharisees. But actually, the text starts out in chapter 2 and verse 23 with an important preface. So we want to pick it up from verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in all people. So here is the cliffhanger already. Uh, the scriptures just said many people started to believe in Jesus because of the signs that they were seeing. And the text lets us know that that's not a full enough or deep enough commitment is to believe in Jesus just because of signs. Because Jesus says, it says about Jesus, Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in all people. So he knew that this was a shallow faith. This was a shallow belief that the people had. So he chose not to entrust himself to them. Can we imagine Jesus not opening himself up to somebody? So that should get us started thinking. Now, he's going to go from that <clears throat> into an example of one of those guys that believed because of the signs. And then Jesus is going to call him out. So we go on to Nicodemus. There was a man named Nicodemus of the Pharisees. Uh, he was a ruler of the Jews. So not just was he a Pharisee, but he was a ruler. The Greek word there is arche. Arche is where we get ark, like the archangel. So that means the archangel is the most important angel. So as we deal with Nicodemus, Nicodemus was the arche of the Jews, which means he was an important, one of the most important, which means he was part of the Sanhedrin. That's what that would deal with. Not only a Pharisee, but also part of the Sanhedrin. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. So he had just prefaced the faith of Nicodemus earlier by saying people were believing in the signs, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in people. This was a shallow faith. So Nicodemus is the same kind of a guy. He believed because of the signs that he was seeing. He wasn't necessarily committed. So in verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He's already coming down on Nicodemus. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say, unless one is born of water and spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, most people, when we come to John, they tend to go to this verse, water and spirit, and, and begin to talk about the baptism. But I think that that's secondary to what we're really getting at. What we're really getting at is Jesus knowing the heart of Nicodemus and basically what his instructions are to Nicodemus. So he says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wants and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it goes. And so is everyone born of the spirit. So Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? And Jesus said, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. But 
you do not receive our testimony. So Jesus sees right through Nicodemus' little claim to believe in who he is. And Jesus calls him out and says, first of all, Nicodemus, you're not honest. You've got to be born again from above. Second of all, Nicodemus, in verse 11, you don't believe our testimony. So if we had G Nicodemus pegged as a decent guy, Jesus has just called him out on two separate occasions. In verse 12, if I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. So what just happened here? Well, let's take up with uh, Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so of the religion of that day, we should say that Nicodemus was a very religious person. Not only was Nicodemus a very religious person, but he was a member of the Pharisees. If we remember, the Pharisees were one of the most disciplined, committed uh, sects of Judaism that were wholly committed to the Moses of law, to the law of Moses. <clears throat> so if you were going to be the epitome of religious in Jesus' day, a Pharisee would have been the person that was that guy. Do we remember Paul when he says, I, I don't want to boast in the flesh, but if anybody is to boast, I'm the guy that has the most to say because I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And when it comes to zeal for the law, I was a Pharisee. So even Paul puts that uh, level of commitment as bar none. To be a Pharisee was a bar none level of commitment to the law of God. And that's who Jesus is speaking to here. Uh, the Jews, as far as the Jews go, just a little bit of background. When John is talking to the Jews, there were four sects of Jews uh, in the time of Jesus. There was the Pharisees, the most committed to the law. There was the Sadducees, which were the more wealthy people. Uh, they, they tended to be more affluent and wealthy. There was the Essenes, and I apologize because I don't know that much about them, but there is some fascinating stuff about the Essenes. And the last group would have been the Nationalists, what eventually become called the Sakari, the ones that were willing to kill and die for their faith. So you have those four. Now, what's interesting is in the New Testament, we really only hear about the Pharisees. And so what that tells us is a little bit of history involved here. Uh, John is writing in 80, and he's always talking about the Pharisees. He doesn't mention the Sadducees much, but that's because the Sadducees had no more important to his audience in the 80s because the Sadducees were phased out in 70 AD when the Jerusalem temple was conquered and Jerusalem was destroyed. The sect of the Sadducees is gone. When Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, you don't hear about the Sadducees anymore in history. So really, the Essenes and the Nationalists are the only ones that are still prominent so little by little, they lose their place, and by 100 A.D., they are no longer uh, prominent in Judaism. So by the time John is writing his letter, really the Pharisees are the only group left of the Jews. That's kind of why they're the only ones we hear about. Now, to be a Pharisee uh, meant to be separated, separated specifically for the law of Moses. And so I want to paint this picture of who Nicodemus was. Because Jesus is about to cut him off at the knees. And I think that's the message that he's giving us in this text. Is uh, understand that um, the Pharisees were the ultra-religious group. Now we learned that not only was Nicodemus a part of the ultra-religious sect of the Jews. But he was also an arche, a leader of the Jews. Which meant he also was in the Sanhedrin. So this is the most elite person that you could be speaking with other than a high priest. The only one that would have been higher than Nicodemus and the Jewish uh, power structure would have been a high priest. So Nicodemus was way up there. When Jesus comes, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, what we are going to find out is that not everybody that comes to Jesus gets saved. 
Now that's kind of a hard one because basically today we kind of say, well, anybody that loves Jesus is good to go. We kind of have this pseudo-conversion where it's a very shallow, minimalistic uh, expression of faith. And we kind of like to extend salvation just to any old good person. But I struggle because the text here today tells us the exact opposite. What are some examples of when people came to Jesus looking for salvation and they go away disappointed? Can we start thinking of any names when we know people came to Jesus? What must I do to be saved? And instead of Jesus making it easy for them, they actually walk away disappointed. We have, first of all, the rich young ruler. I want to be saved. And the scripture says... He went away from Jesus grieved. Isn't that right? Because our scripture told us today, verses 24 and 25, the ones that I said kind of prefaced our text, said Jesus did not reveal himself to certain people because he knew their hearts. Jesus knew their hearts. And so Jesus has a custom response for anybody that comes to him because he knows their heart. Do we remember Jesus saying, you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven unless you become like a child? That was his response to one group of people. Uh, if we look, look with me at Luke chapter 9, because right in chapter 9, we see a whole series of disappointments when people come to Jesus for salvation. If we look in uh, Luke chapter 9, he's going to give us three or four of these examples. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. The first one, he said to everyone, if you would come after me, let him take up, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I am sorry, that's not it. 57, Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. Here we go. Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was explaining the real reality of what it was going to be like to follow him. To another person, the second person, he said, follow me. And when the guy said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. There's a little explanation to the idea of burying my father. Sometimes we, we kind of get the impression that this guy was in a funeral procession and he was taking his dad to be buried. But the idea of let me bury my father was actually somebody who was living with a parent or a person in the last phase of their life, right? You're living with your grandmother and you know she's on uh, shaky ground. You know death in the next year or two or five is kind of... So it's kind of like, before I make a brand new commitment, let me hang out with this person for the last couple of years of their life. This is what I'm dedicated to. And then after I finish these last few years of this person's life, then I'll go, because I can't make any commitments right now. So that's what that uh, Greek idiom would have been, is let me live out these last few years of my father's life. Jesus responds to him, that's not good enough. Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Quite a disappointment. In verse 61, another person said to him, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go say goodbye to everybody at my home. Now that doesn't sound like too bad a deal. That sounds like a pretty willing person, right? Jesus' response, nobody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so we see four people coming up to Jesus saying, I want to be saved. I want to be with you. And four times, Jesus sees through the person to their heart. And he says the one thing that makes them realize this is a bigger commitment than what I was willing to offer. Jesus required more from a person than what they were prepared to offer. And so we see those examples that not everybody that comes to Jesus is guaranteed to be saved by Jesus because he speaks right to the heart. 
And he tells each individual, this is what you're going to have to give up in order to follow me. So we come to Nicodemus with that understanding. And basically when Nicodemus comes to him, Jesus cuts through all the conversation and says, Nicodemus, you're not saved. That's like saying Mufasa. And shivers. I, that was one of the reasons why I uh, went and spent those two weeks in Virginia. Is because Johnny, the preacher down there, I saw him going into the community and speaking to people boldly, saying, this is a real life and death situation. There's a real life and death choice that you have to make, people. Embrace Christ and be obedient to his gospel and be saved. Or think you don't need him and suffer the wrath of God. That makes me shiver. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not to that point yet. And yet, if we look at scripture, isn't that the reality that that the Gospels and the Scriptures paint, isn't that, isn't that the purpose of Christianity? Is to let the world know that there's only two possibilities. Accept Christ and be saved, reject Him, and suffer the wrath of God. Ooh, but that's not a comfortable topic. I'm sitting here talking to a bunch of believers, and I'm uncomfortable saying that. What happens when we go out into the world and we see somebody <clears throat> living life like there's no tomorrow as if they were their own boss and as if nothing was coming after we die? Do we have the, the first of all, <laughs> do we have the love for that person to say, oh, please, let me spend a few minutes with you? I've got to at least say Jesus was real. The, the, the preponderance of evidence for Jesus being real is overwhelming. As a matter of fact, um, just a little side note. There's a guy named uh, <clears throat> Daniel Wallace who is the premier living Greek scholar of our day. Daniel Wallace. And Daniel Wallace said, uh, when you look at any kind of Greek history of which we have proof, so something like that would be Alexander the Great. Has anybody ever heard of Alexander the Great? We all know about him. He conquered all of the Mediterranean, right? Okay. He said when it comes to Alexander the Great, which the world believes in and our history books tell us about, you can read a lot about Alexander the Great. He said we have 20 manuscripts, 20 Greek manuscripts that tell us about Alexander the Great. And of those 20 Greek manuscripts, and I forget how many pages, but there is about two and a half feet. If we took all of those 20 Greek manuscripts that we have on Alexander the Great and stuck them high, uh, it would be two and a half feet deep, the amount of manuscripts we have on him. Uh, Alexander the Great is pretty well attested. A lot of the other things like Roman history, uh, some of the uh, proconsuls and emperors of Rome, very little documentation on them, but we all believe in them. And so Daniel Wallace says, okay, so we're going to err on, on the good side. Take Alexander the Great, who probably has some of the most literature that we have found on him, and that's going to stand about two feet high, and that's in the best case scenario. Now, if we compare the New Testament documents that we have, Compared to the 20 documents that we have on Alexander the Great, we have over 5,000 documents on the New Testament. And this is, you don't have to be a believer, you could be a scientist, and this is just the, the, the plain truth. 5,000 documents that we have on the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and 20 manuscripts that we have on Alexander the Great. Everybody believes in Alexander the Great, not everybody believes in Jesus. On the other side of that, uh, when it comes to Alexander the Great, um, <clears throat> his manuscripts will stand about two feet tall. 
If you were to take the 5,000 manuscripts that we have on the New Testament, my understanding is that they'll be a mile high. So the preponderance, they, they, they say that it, there's an embarrassing, when Greek scholars research history, when it comes to the Bible, there's an embarrassing amount of literature that proves the Bible to be true, proves Jesus to be true. It's a mile high. When it comes to the literature that we have to prove that uh, Alexander the Great is true, it's only two feet high. So somebody said you can't possibly believe in Alexander the Great and not believe in Jesus because the amount of information that we have is a hundred times greater than the amount of information we have on Alexander the Great. So uh, when he was looking at, at, at uh, Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, you're not saved. You've got to be born again. This one statement that Jesus gives Nicodemus would have crushed his whole world. That's why I tried to paint the importance of being a Pharisee and being a, 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 Sag, a, a, a member of the Sanhedrin is Nicodemus' whole life had been invested in his religion and in his entering the kingdom on those terms. And this is what we have. Jesus' words regarding the fact that Nicodemus needed to be born again shattered once and for all every supposed excellence and effort that Nicodemus had ever put forward. Everything that he had built his hopes on throughout a long, arduous life had turned into ruin and had become a worthless heap of ashes. For Jesus to tell Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you have to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. You're not saved. You're not there. Everything that Nicodemus had done in his religious life had been basically boiled down to nothing. How many friends or family or converts from other religions to be brought into the Church of Christ have had to face that same devastation. Do you mean everything I have been taught since I was a child has been a lie? Jesus would have no problem saying yes. Everything you were taught was a lie. This person over here, you mean my grandmother that spent her whole life in the church over here and I grew up and all it, are you telling me that all of that was a lie? Well, Jesus would say, yeah. Not easy for me to be the guy to say that. But as we look at Nicodemus' example, Nicodemus is exactly that person. A Pharisee of the Pharisee, the strictest sect of Moses' law observers a leader of the Jews in the Sanhedrin, and Jesus has no problem cutting him off at the knees and saying, Nicodemus, you're not saved. You have to be born again, Nicodemus. Let's look at what opportunities Nicodemus would have had. And I'll just roll them off for you. First of all, do we remember when John the Baptist was baptizing? John the Baptist's job was to prepare Israel for the coming of Christ. And so people that were ready for Christ had already accepted John the Baptist's message. Well, do we remember that we already looked in chapter 1 that the priests, the, uh, the, the priests and the Levites were sent to John the Baptist to inquire of him, are you the prophet, are you the Christ, are you Elijah? It was the leaders of the Pharisees that were told later that sent those guys to, to John the Baptist to ask him who he was. So Nicodemus knew about John the Baptist. Nicodemus would have been in that leadership role to send those priests to go ask John who he was. That would have been Nicodemus' first opportunity to be sincere and true and to be a convert. The second one was John was baptizing. John the Baptist was baptizing, and Nicodemus, as well as the Pharisees, rejected the baptism of John the Baptist. How do we know that? You can turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verse 29, when all the people heard this, the tax collectors as well, they declared God just by having been baptized by the baptism of John the Baptist. Now watch the word here. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves because they would not what? Because they would not be baptized by John the Baptist. So we've got Nicodemus. We know that him being the leader of the Pharisees, 
The Pharisees refused to be baptized by John the Baptist. So there's strike number two. First, they didn't listen to John the Baptist, strike one. Strike number two, they weren't baptized by John the Baptist. And, Jesus, and the text tells us they rejected the will of God by not being baptized. So strike number two for Nicodemus. Strike number three, do you remember in Matthew when Jesus asked the Pharisees, John's baptism, where did it come from? Did it come from man or did it come from God? And we know the response that Jesus was expecting, right? John's baptism, where did it come from? And so the Pharisees, Nicodemus' group, chose to play dumb. And they said, we don't know. Because if they said the baptism came from man, the people would get angry at them because they thought John was a prophet. But if they say the baptism was from God, Jesus would have said, then why weren't you baptized if that's what God said to do? So the Pharisees play dumb. Strike number three. Strike number four is in our text, in case we think we're getting a little too far-fetched. Strike number four is in our text. Let's continue down uh, our gospel, John chapter, John chapter three. And as we read down, and Jesus is trying to explain these things to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you're not good. Nicodemus, you're coming to me with the appearance of wanting to believe in me, but you're rejecting everything that I tell you you must do. And so uh, we read in our section of Scripture today, John chapter 3, verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. You do not receive our testimony. Later on, Jesus will tell the Pharisees, your chief job is to study Moses. But Jesus says, if you really believed Moses, you would believe in me. Strike number five. Finally, in John chapter eight, I'll bring us to a close here. John chapter eight, we see the greatest, the greatest uh, defamation of all. In John chapter eight and verse 31, just to get a feeling for who he's talking to. Jesus was talking to the Jews who had believed in him. Okay, so there's our context. We believe in you. Jesus was speaking to the Jews who believed in him. He began to speak to them about being enslaved. They said, we've never been enslaved to anybody. And Jesus says, if you are a slave to sin, then you are a slave. But if the Son of Man sets you free, you will be free. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, and what are the words? Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. That's chapter 3 and verse 37. So here we have those that are believing in Jesus, and yet Jesus is saying, you want to kill me. What a strange dichotomy. Just like Nicodemus, hey, I believe in you. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, then why aren't you doing what I'm telling you to do? You've got six strikes against you already. Here we see believers in Jesus, but they don't like what he has to say. And so they want to kill him. And so what's the call today? I believe, as I struggled with the text, I wanted to find some cool spin, some interesting Greek thing, something that would be fun and interesting. And really what I find in the text is judgment. Judgment about uh, a pseudo kind of a faith. Uh, people coming to Jesus saying, I believe in you, and yet hating what he has to say. Uh, Nicodemus coming to Jesus saying, I believe, it's obvious you're from God, because nobody can do the signs you do. And yet Jesus exposes the six strikes that are against him. And so what I wanted to do is bring to our mind that Jesus clearly abandons, uh, when we come to Christ, he clearly teaches us an abandoning of ourself and a submitting to him. An abandoning of self and a submitting to him. And to even say that it's not easy. It has to go beyond lip service. When, when, when Christ said in Matthew, why do you call me Lord? Like Nicodemus. 
but you don't do what I tell you to do. And so what was mindful to me was, uh, it's a little bit severe, but a little bit of a wake-up call to us that Jesus is serious when he talks about salvation and the dedication that he expects from his church, from his people. I'll close with the scripture that says, examine yourself to see whether or not you are in the faith. We've spent all this time looking at the Pharisees that were coming to Jesus, but he said, nope, you're not in. You've you've got to be completely born again. You've got to die to yourself, and you've got to become a brand new person. You can't get in being the way you are. And so with that reality, to examine ourselves, to see whether you truly are in the faith, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, test yourself. Test yourself and do you not realize that Christ is in you unless, of course, you should fail the test. Uh, If anything, guys, what I wanted to paint was just a, a sobering picture, right? Just a sobering picture that uh, being followers of Christ, being believers of Christ, the pseudo easy words doesn't get us deep enough into our relationship with him to really consider a person saved. Not everybody talking about heaven is going there. And I just wanted to just have us look at ourselves. Do we have that kind of commitment that Jesus was looking for? Do we have that kind of obedience that Christ expects to look at ourselves and see if we are truly giving our best to our Savior? Let's pray.